so I think at this point, at this point, anyway, so today, um, three days from now, the tech might be completely advanced, but today, um, yeah, from what I understand, AI is still sort of very high polygon, um, very six fingers still, <laughs> um, <laughs> Is what I'm going to call that stage of the evolution of uh, image-based AI. Um, so we're at the six stages, uh, the six fingers stage of 3D assets, um, and yeah. So there's there's different approaches I think to to fixing them. So in my mind, and, and I, I I'm a bit harsh on AI because one the ethics and two, you get a lot of people saying they're AI artists when they're just typing a sentence. Now, you are 100% a client or a director or a producer or like there's many other words you can use, but artist is not one of them. Um, unless, and that's what you do with what we do today where you'll take the asset um, and then improve or optimize that asset once it's made. So there's a whole spectrum of things that we need to figure out, even the wording. Um, it's really, it's a weird space. We're in weird times, man. <laughs> But interesting times as well. So we'll see. Uh, what kind of avatar are you making? What kind of theme? Well, I'm just looking really uh, to, to hit the VRM standard. Right. Because I'm, I've been researching the whole uh, VRM standard and I noticed that uh, like like the bones, the skeletons, it has to be anthropomorphic. Uh, you can't be doing six finger stuff. Uh, mm. it's, it's pretty weak. It's pretty restrictive when it comes to, uh, you know, interoperability. I guess that's that's really the, the, the key there. So I'm I've been looking at at the file format and looking, you know, what kind of freedoms I have within there. And I guess the next thing I'm really up against is how I'm going to color it, well, because there's a limitation on uh, texture maps that I'm allowed here. Yep. Yep. Um, in regards to, and it depends on how creative you want to get with it though. So say for example, the bones that, um, you create for your VRM, uh, are limited to the animations of the ecosystems you put it into, but, and I've done this myself, um, you can add extra bones and do interesting things with them, um, for your own purposes. So, so uh, say for example, I've used, um, spring bones for a mm -hmm. scarf, um, so it sort of uh, uh, flops around a little bit, uh, like nicely. I've got, I've done Ninja Turtle, I completed some Ninja Turtles, so I've made all of Ninja Turtles and their bow and swords sort of uh, flop at their back shell and stuff like that. Um, so you can have extra bones. So what you could do if you really wanted to, and it'd be a bit weird, you'd have your five fingers, but if you wanted six fingers, you could put the sixth finger as a spring bone. <laughs> Right. Um, or right. you could um, have six fingers or whatever, and or like you could have ten fingers, but then in each bone you put two fingers, so it looks right. like it has ten, right. but it's 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 still only got five. So the approach to if you really want to push some of the things you can do with VRMs, you just have to get a little bit creative with regards to what the uh, platform you're using it on will do with it. So if you're running, it'll use, probably use the five animations, uh, the, the set animation, but then you can sort of extend that a little bit with spring bones or interesting rigging and stuff like that. So there's, there's ways around it. Uh, that said, yes, um, bipedal, um, is normal. Um, I have tried cause this is what I do. I have tried making an octopus. <laughs> um, oh, okay. And putting and seeing what happens when you put the bones elsewhere, so the, the right amount of bones. So I put the arms as four, like four front tentacles, um, and legs as the back tentacles, um, and that that doesn't work very well at all. <laughs> so just a heads up on that. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing is also that cat. It, it depends on how each platform uses the animation. So some will be. Um, Kind of bone rotations and nothing else some will be kind of positioned like there's there's all different approaches to how each platform uh uses that information so it's a bit it's a bit of a minefield um vrms are not really good formats unfortunately um but I'm, i think they're getting there because they're getting a bit more um more people are getting involved with them so i'm hoping that they improve the 
uh, format in order to support more complicated things like constraints and um, like bones that follow other bones. Because if you do that, then you've got then you can do quadrupeds and stuff like that. Right. Right. Uh, but they're not there yet, so maybe they will. But we'll see. Um, so I was yeah. mostly looking at. You. I was mostly looking at. Uh, those extra spring bones to do things like hair yeah and uh maybe like larger ears yeah or uh, even something you know dangly jewelry yep. something of that nature yeah for sure like that's, that's the normal one that's that that's the <laughs> the ones you should do tentacles on octopuses yeah <laughs> mixed bag um but yeah yeah i'm, I'm clearly at at, at at entry stage i consider myself a total Noob at this level, even though I have a fairly good understanding of 3D and code, it's just coming into here and, and learning all this other stuff about the the, the file formats and yeah. it all is just uh, quite a bit because I'm, of course, at the same time I have to learn Blender, mm -hmm. and then at the same time I'm learning Unity. Yeah. So it's like okay, I got plenty on my plate today. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I, I am, uh, what would you call it? Like a compulsive learner. I can't finish anything because as soon as I learn, it's like, oh, okay, I get it now. I'll start the new, I say, I could do it again because I could do it better now. Um, and then never finish anything because I have to learn the next thing. Um, and cause I'm like a generalist, like I want to, I wanted to learn the code and all the rest of it. So I'll learn the code. I'll do some code. I'll make a game. Um, and then it's like, oh, I want to get back to sculpting cause I need to do that. So I'll go jump into that. Um, and then spend ages on that. And it's like, oh, now to do sub D because you have to re to apologize it. So do that. Um, and then on the next project, I'll go back to programming or look back at what I've done. And it's like, who wrote this? Because I don't understand anything mm. of it. <laughs> it's so right. frustrating. It is so frustrating. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's what we have to do as builders, I guess. Or as generalists, anyway. Right, right. <laughs> and then I'm also investigating. Uh, generative ai yeah and i want to fine tune one to you know my predilections right. and actually have that run my avatar right so i'm i'm going the whole route uh okay. voice to text text to the large language model large language model back to voice uh all, the the whole ball of wax. I'm I'm just gonna do my best to build out a digital clone of my best self. <laughs> yeah, I have um, I've been working on it for many years, and, and once again, it's one of those things where you come back to it. Many many years ago, I think it was at least six six to ten years ago, I started writing some docs of my own, um, and I like they got long. Like I've got pages and pages of content there from like mental health and creativity because that's a whole thing. Um, but also like programming and that's how I learned how to program is by teaching it because that's the way I, I, I learn hard things because um, I have to translate it from engineers who talk in a very different way when it comes to programming um, and like uh, asset creation and all that sort of stuff um, came back to it later it's like this is a lot of stuff that I don't remember writing any of <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's like like each each doc is like anywhere from five to 20 pages long and there's like a good 30 pages at least or 30 30 categories at least so it's nuts but unfortunately i have the, I have the problem of um overwriting right so i say too much and so i'll bring up the same things that i brought up recently uh, in a previous doc because that's really important so i kind of have to go over the whole thing and say okay what's what's been said what hasn't been what can be said less because people don't like reading anymore it's all very complicated <laughs> Yes, but I can fun. totally relate to. Yeah, it's it's fun, but it's it's a long process. But yeah, AI is AI is an interesting one. I'm I'm kind of for the tech. I'm not for the culture that comes with it. Late stage capitalism oh, is exactly that. the wrong time to introduce something so powerful. It's nuts. <laughs> That's why I'm really into what they call edge AI, working on like single board computers. Right. And not be, not being hooked up to the cloud and having my own standalone AI in the corner that I get to train up the way I want to. Yeah, that's probably the smart way to go about it. 
I don't mind what, what Facebook's doing because they, they're leaning into it and just like being able to create your own personas for whatever reason. I think it's an interesting one. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Once again, like in my mind, it's like open sourcing nukes. Like that's how powerful AI is going to get. And we're just going, hey, oh, everyone, yeah. have access at it. It's like, yeah. Oh. About that. <laughs> It's a lot, it's going to be a lot of work before they have the interfaces that's going to let eighty percent of anybody get on. Yeah, there's still a lot of gatekeeping and technical hoops, and and that's okay. I, I don't I don't, think, I don't mind I don't that. Hmm? I, I don't mind that. I think that's okay. We need to limit. We need to slow this whole process down because it's affecting a little bit yeah. too many things. There's a natural limit to just how many people can actually implement and then find some way to leverage the technology yeah i mean I did, in some ways it, it's like driving to a barnyard and and throwing a, a set of keys at the at, at the at a horse and saying okay here you have the <laughs> tractor you drive it yeah yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to watch it's gonna be terrible to be part of <laughs> <laughs> Now, let me see. I got um, I got some Paradox did uh, Luma AI um, assets. So I'm hoping to look at some of them. Uh, let's get... Uh, let's just randomly choose some of these. 1, 5, 10, and 15. Import. Ah, there we go. Yep. And that is why we don't want these to be... Yeah, that works. Okay, so let's go. G X. So I'm sharing the screen if you want to if you want to watch. Okay, how do I do that? Um, in in the chat, like in the voice chat, click on the window. Um, it should hopefully uh, tell me if it doesn't have my stream. Theoretically. Yeah. Okay, um, there it is. Yeah. Oh. Cool. Okay. That one's. <laughs> okay. Wow, cool, I see it. Excellent. Um, so what we're going to basically be doing is looking at those, there's two, like, let's say three, three main approaches um, to this whole ecosystem, right? The one I'm probably going to lean to personally is using this as purely reference, right? So because these assets are here, I can very easily make an asset myself. Uh, faster because the proportions if I like this I can think of the proportions I can clean it up I can improve it stuff like that um, like this one <laughs> I would never use this as an asset so this would be a probably a good example for that one uh, this one in the middle is not bad um, we have some glitches like every AI will have glitches once again that's our whole four finger uh, six finger thing situation um, and this one's this one's pretty not, not bad um, once again, I think that, like the tech is going to get better in, in one month, six months, one year. We're going to have um, probably even the re like the retopology version. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll all be looking for new jobs then. But we can get by with what we can. So uh, let's have a look. Uh, tools, and I don't know how this is going to go. So I'm, gonna, I'm kind of interested. So I'm going to duplicate this one. Shift D. Let's go Y up here. Um, the quickest and fastest way to optimize, but also the worst, um, is using decimation and remeshing. Uh, so those tools are in here. Decimate. Uh, the thing is, I think it will also break the map. Uh, so let's do... Ooh, hang on. Oh no, it is connected. Ooh, interesting. Ah, it keeps it. Nice. Okay, so. Uh... Well, that's good to know. Um, Decimate can uh, clean up with some of these. So I'm going to undo that so we can go back. 
this one. So planar, uh, let's go back to this so we can see it. Um, and then you've got these sort of things. Um, and then it will sort of add them back because I haven't applied this, right? So if I apply it, actually let's do this to see the difference. Statistics, there we go. So that is 9,000, let's say 9,000. If we put that back on, now that is 6,000, um, which is significantly less. We can push that up maybe. So let's go to 10, see how that goes. That's fine. Um, and it kind of looks the same. So we've actually moved this down to 4,500. The model looks the same. Um, and then if we applied that, it would be fine. Let's go, let's see how far we can push that. Yeah, not bad. Um, 30. Okay. Down to 2,300. Looks mostly the same. Now, if this was a small asset, this would be fine. Um, I could even probably push that even further if I wanted to. Yeah, that's not bad. 1,700 at a distance. Looks exactly the same. So decimation is stupid fast. And depending on the asset, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so that's one. I don't like it though because I'm a control freak. That's basically what it comes down to. What's collapse do? Uh, two? No. Five. Ah, there we go. Alright. Same again. Uh, about the same reduction. So it's not too bad. Um, so yeah, decimate is one approach to uh, fast, but let's say unprofessional. <laughs> Uh, uh, reduction of polygons. The next one is remesh. <laughs> Vox doesn't work. Boxes makes it blocks smooth. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, see that's... Remesh doesn't really look great. Yeah, so in this particular case, it doesn't work very well because remesh will kind of like, how would you, what would you say it? Remesh will make very clean quad versions of your mesh um, across, the, across the whole experience. So remeshing is more cleaning up. Yeah, that's it. Remeshing is more cleaning up the model um, and it will usually like better algorithms will sort of clean the, um, like find the creases and keep the creases. So the edge loops are a lot better. Um, so remeshing is maybe not very good at optimization. It is good for cleaning up assets so you can uh, better app apply stuff to them. So that's that one. Um, Z, uh, ZBrush has really good remesh tools. Um, I think uh, Blender does with the sculpting. You can do some cool stuff there. Um, and there's another thing called instant meshes, um, which is a really good application for that as well. So yeah, decimation, remeshing, uh, ways to optimize or clean up a mesh. Uh, the other approach is retopology just straight up. So this one's maybe for you, Jay, because I like remeshing. Ah, uh, sorry, retopology. I think it's kind of very zen. <laughs> So I'm going to get rid of all of that. I'm going to have one block. I'm going to go to Vertex. I'm going to go up here, go to Snap. Go down to Face. And just press G a lot. Okay. Uh, so where you start doesn't matter. But what the Snap does is basically snaps to the face. And that allows you to basically do whatever you need to do. Let's see if this works today, because it wasn't working yesterday. It was really annoying. No. Ah, I think I, know, I, think I figured out why. Uh, in front, 
means my asset that I'm making will always be in front of this. It doesn't work <laughs> in uh, these other situations. So um, viewport shading is pretty much the only one that needs, needs to work on. Okay. Uh, let's go there, 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 there. Um, so in this case, I'm just using, so far, uh, what is it, um, G for moving things around, uh, E for extrusion, uh, one approach is basically make it like per polygon, if that makes sense. So here we'd be sort of like going across. The other approach is something like this. <laughs> uh, put it over here, E again. Um, and then control R to add sort of the blocks um, or edge loops in the middle. Let's do that one, I think. Yep. Um, and then go back to vertex mode and back to G. So it just sort of snaps it all. Now that's going to be a bit weird because it goes down. To there. Um, and that's that's it. That's that's the whole process. Just for the rest of the process. <laughs> um, what are some other useful tools that I find with retopology? Uh, the knife tool. Uh, so K allows you to cut where we want. Uh, be careful where you place it. So if if the thing that you're interacting with goes yellow or red or whatever, um, that's good. Uh, but if I, for example, put it here, that would put it, and I wanted to go there, that's an extra polygon, um, which you don't want because you're getting real tight with polygon count. So basically you want, uh, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, basically you want to sort of uh, clean up um, and make sure all of the things are tightly placed so you don't have loose or unwanted is more the point uh, in unwanted um, polygons um, another very useful tool is mirror um, so let's do this I'm going to move those up to there these two into the middle G Y there we go. say about there go to modifier add a mirror modifier on the Y axis which is there because the pivot is there so I'm gonna go control a to apply all transforms which will put it back into the center, and then you've got that. So as I make this, I will automatically make this, which halves the time. So Jay, how much time do you have on uh, Retopology so far? You've been playing around with it for a while, or just new? He's disappeared. <laughs> well, I, I had done a couple tutorials doing something similar to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they weren't really giving me the low polygon count I was looking for. Right. So as I was looking at tutorials for making characters, 
they often said, well, uh, start with a piece of flat artwork profile and front view and wow. then place them on the appropriate axis and and kind of kind of sculpt in the middle to match that. Right. And I thought, well, why should I do that when I can get a high poly count exactly what I want to look at and put that in the middle, mm -hmm. but then construct my own low poly count body according to what I've seen uh, like on YouTube about how those bodies are constructed. And there's a lot of people doing really cool low poly bodies like on the Pixar model and whatever. Yeah. And it, it just took me a couple of weeks to like sort through that stuff until saying, okay, this is what I need for my, for my model. And then I actually constructed that model around my original high mesh model. Right. So, that, so I'm building it that way. And then I'm going to come back with the sculpt tools and these tools that you're working with now to adjust all my geometry over the top of the high polycon geometry. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a slightly different uh, workflow, but it means that I'm guaranteed at the beginning of of constructing my model low poly count right from the get go, according to the standards that you should have if you're doing let's say a, a game character. Yeah, and that, that that's the thing. Like I think now AI kind of adds an extra layer of. Uh, I guess approach to it um so you can kind of yeah like as as i said like use these assets as tools to either speed up your creation process so you get um what would you do it you get an ai asset that looks like the way you did because you did a sketch or you got mid journey to make an image and then put that through stability ai and then make the asset for 3d that way and then basically do a high poly sculpt using the AI sculpt as a reference, um, and then retopologize and make the low poly. Um, so like we're, we're just adding more tools to the ecosystem of creation. Um, which one you choose is up to you, um, depending on how much time you've got, how big your team is, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, another tool it's, I just yeah, used there, like... just just uh, just quickly was F. Um, so you, you select the polygon, I'll get rid of this one just to show that, just to cover each thing um, that I'm doing. Um, so if you have two edges like this, if you press F, it'll just put it over there. Um, so that's a really quick way to sort of get a line and once again, follow, like that one is a really precise way to put the polygons where you want rather than sort of E, uh, E all of them like that and then just go E there. So I'm gonna to have to manually make or manually set all of the ones there. Whereas if I use the F tool, I'll just like make them quicker manually. So yeah, pick your poison basically. <laughs> uh, yeah, what are you were gonna say? Oh, no, no, it's, uh, you, you're doing great. <laughs> I usually uh, select the option to, so that the, they snap along the, the mirror axis and yes clipping is so in the hat that one yeah um yeah, and, yeah i was gonna say that because yeah, yeah. That be... that's messy this side's <laughs> good <laughs> this side is not <laughs> um but yeah so what i might let's just shortcut that so with clipping on uh yeah you're right it, mm -hmm. it's a really good snap like so so we might do that for this side because that's messy but for the other side we might add another loop in there as well Yeah, this one. Yeah, it's interesting also coming from... Because I came from Unreal Tournament. Um, the original. <laughs> so, making assets has always been... Kind of this approach more than the sculpting approach. Uh, which kind of changes how you think about making assets. So, I've always come from optimization first um mm -hmm. whereas when you get to zbrush and like grow up with zbrush it's like make it look good and then figure out how to optimize it um <laughs> right and it changes how you think about things <laughs> um an ai is going to be probably an, a, another shift again kind of thing um in regards to 
what what how do we make our assets what we, what's the flow um and all that sort of stuff it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how it plays out i think but the fact that like yeah, say, really good. uh the fact that unreal like it doesn't like there's no poly count anymore it doesn't matter in unreal in webgl it very much matters so vrms and stuff do have to poly count like keep the poly counts in check but uh if you're using unreal that's very different <laughs> Which is cool because now you can do movies in games. Like Mandalorian is made in virtual production, which is nuts. But yeah, not WebGL. Yeah, I, st I started in 3D with VRML, which was uh, oh, right, right yeah, from the yeah, beginning. Yeah. You were challenged with polycount. Yeah. I think um, what is it? VR Chat has an interesting approach to. Uh, avatars like they're they're really quite powerful you can do pretty much anything with those right it's uh they use take advantage of the unity uh ability to uh have face expressions yeah and all of them do like you look I at really um like... vision pro and all of that even though like vision pro is mm -hmm. slightly horrifying um in its current state um but yeah the, the fact you've got and also ai versions of it so like you can talk normal because NVIDIA did a really interesting um, audio to capture, but it also does, like, it captures, like, your your face as well um, in, in AI. It looks really, really good. Um, so I don't know if you've seen that. What's it called? Um, I forget what it's called. Uh, I've seen Sora. Have you yeah, seen Sora? Sora's, yeah. I, I worry about Sora. Like, that's that's society done. <laughs> we're, we're done. <laughs> Um, yeah, like it's cool, uh, but once again, like wrong stage of humanity to have something that replaces humanity, because um, video is everything now. Like if you if you really look at our society, most of it is basically video. Um, so making, yeah, I'm I'm a bit worried about Sora actually, um, from a what would you call it societal level, um, from a tech level amazing like it was great like those dogs like seeing the puppies oh, yeah. bouncing in the snow i was i was pretty yeah. shocked at that one but um, the ant only had uh, four legs yeah <laughs> um but yeah you had the 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 birthday one where like she was kind of like looking at the cake like a little to the left <laughs> and yeah. Like, yeah yeah the, the hands like everyone clapping in the background is like that's a little Worry. That said, the first time I watched it, didn't even notice. Even though I knew it was AI and I was kind of looking for faults, I couldn't find it. Um, but then uh, the the video I watched was like pretty good, and it's like okay. So keep in mind and just know that hands are a bit broken. It was like I knew that, but the second <laughs> time I saw it, it's like ah oh, yeah no yeah that's horrifying. So yeah, it was a it was a weird case, but it was also extremely good. And I think I think I was hoping that OpenAI would kind of slow down. Because they're the, they're the ones at the forefront. Um, and I, I got the impression that they sort of understood the risks that are now involved. But it's like, oh, no, we're just going to do everything better. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Well, so. the, the spooky thing for me is that uh, Sora was actually uh, primarily written by GPT-5. Right. Oh, was so, it? You, so you have one... You have one generative AI ah. creating another generative AI yeah. much faster than any human team could possibly do it. Yeah. Now that's that's where we're at now is and once again for science this is the best thing that has ever happened. For society it is possibly the worst thing that has ever happened. So <laughs> we're going to be really smart dumb animals. <laughs> it's going to it's going to be yep. weird. Gonna be weird. Um, so yeah, horrifying and awesome at exactly the same time in equal measure. Exactly. Okay, so I've, I've nearly finished this asset. Um, now let's look at some of the, the questions. So, say for example, we've got some weird glitches here. Uh, we have some holes here. What what even is that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so those are those are doors. 
with a little tiny hole in the middle. Um, this is a good door, so that's okay. Um, so let's say some of the choices that I'd be looking at now is do I want to add the extra polygons in these doors? Um, or do I want to uh, bake this information into the polygon? Um, if all of the doors look like this, I would probably bake it. But because it's not, <laughs> uh, maybe I would uh, just bake them all and make them all flat. So let's say I'm actually going to get rid of, not rid of, I'm going to turn off snap. Um, and let's just sort of like optimize this a bit. Get rid of those. Once again, just go F and then I'll sort of create that there. Uh, oh, another tool I'll use, um, if I select, uh, let's just hide that money. If I select two edges, press F, it'll just close those two. So that's another very common thing that I will use um, in the space. Okay. Um, so yeah, so choices on that, like, so if, if this was an important asset, I would definitely add the door in there. Although, to be honest, if this was an important asset, I would be remaking this. So I would be using the 3D asset purely as a uh, reference and remaking it from scratch. So I would make all of these um, tiles and stuff like manually. I would probably sculpt a lot of it, um, make a really good high poly sculpt uh, using this as sort of 3D reference. Um, but if this was in the background, yeah, actually, that's an interesting approach. If I was using this in the background of a space, so this was like in the, the mountains or whatever you want to call it, um, I would probably get rid of most <laughs> of this. Uh, let's get rid of that one. So I'd remove those and do that. Um, because you just don't need... Probably even that one. Yeah. Um, you just don't need that de that detail when you're about this big. Um, so let's let's do both. Let's do let's see, let's see how we go for time. Let's see if we can do both bakes and see if there's a comparison and see how that holds up because I'm kind of interested in that. Uh, let's add another one. Should I get rid of that one? Nope. Let's add another one in there. All right, let's close this off. Um, method one. Uh, one, two. Uh, another very useful tool is bevel. So I'm gonna do that one and bevel. The reason I did that is so I can quad mesh these ones quads are not as important as they used to be, but they are very useful um, when creating assets so you can edge loop, like select things real quick. So uh, Alt, left click, will select all of that real quickly, which is what you want. So how many have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six. So let's go, let's do five. Join those. those and then we can kind of close this one up mm. who is that moody how's it going oh how you doing guys Close it off. Hey, Moody, how you going? How y'all doing? Uh, put snap back on. There we go.
Reed Bullock again, huh? Always. It's Rip G. L. <laughs> man. You don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is also, like, a lot of our a lot of our builders, I think, are coming from places that don't need to do it. So you're looking at architecture and all that sort of stuff. So uh, if I constantly do retopology, then they'll hopefully understand that this is what we need to do. <laughs> yeah, also focus, uh, focus more. Uh, you, you've described it already so many times, but I want you to focus more on uh, uh, texture modeling. Like when you model with the texture itself, instead of taking the approach of making a high poly and then baking it and then making an exclusive texture for that object, this is for hero uh, objects or centerpieces. Yeah. But usually uh, it, it's about, uh, uh, you, you already have several tutorials on YouTube for trim sheets. Right. Which is wonderful because once you have all the sheets and materials and polys you want, you bake them into just one plane and make it a texture. And then from there you start making shapes out of these textures. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a whole other approach, but yeah. Trim sheets are great. I think they're really fun. <laughs> I'm I'm interested in like making a VRM um, with a mix between trim sheets and baked like like really take all of the things from palette texturing, trim sheets, mm -hmm. baking, um, and just trying to make a really cool, interesting VRM with that approach because I don't know it just sounds like fun to me. <laughs> Well, here's my post to VRM. I uh, I first uh, start modeling the VRM and pieces and all that uh, stuff individually. And I use trim sheets in, in designing the pieces itself. Like if you're making an armor and you want to decorate it with some patterns and stuff, you model all that with millions of vertices and then bake them into trim sheets. And then use these trim sheets to create even high poly assets. And then eventually you just dig the whole thing because it's a VRM, it's a centerpiece on its own, it's not a space. So you just dig the whole thing eventually, including the trims that you used uh, in the modeling process. So that's yeah. why I'm saying that there is there is this um, uh, texture modeling that you you model the thing itself with, with already made patterns. And then you can bake it and rebake it as much as you want. But in VRMs, I use trim sheets in designing the, the pieces and the parts because it's easier and gives more details and then eventually I just bake the whole thing in one texture. Right. But, yeah. Let's get one. Okay, so let's cram in all these UV maps as much as possible. Uh, there is this uh, paid add-on called uh, UV Master Pack. You just select all and... and uh, you, yeah, you, you I need to get everything. that, I think. Yeah, and it arranges everything and it utilizes the texture files and the textile density. And yeah, it, it it's... Makes it's it I think in the past, like I've... Um, what would you call it? I, I think in the past, I've actually kind of enjoyed the UV process. Um, but... It is slower I still do. <laughs> than it needs to be. No, 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 I still do. The UV process is is how you model anything. To me, it's it's the most uh, important step. I, I I think in my mind, I just like I in, I personally enjoyed unwrapping, um, so I kind of like just did it myself purely because I enjoyed it. <laughs> um, it was quite quite zen. I, I really kind of like the the zeniness of it. Um, that said, yeah, um, it is also a very slow process. Um, so yeah, I'll probably have to figure out a way to not do that anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, where are we at? Which one is it? This one. Okay. So I'm going to make two of these, um, uh, and let's do level of detail because why not? Um, so let's go, what's this one? Mesh? No, that's what it's called. Um, temple. Now with LOD and uh, what is it called uh, in Unity, you can actually if you name the asset specifically, it will do it for you. So I think it's LOD one. 
So that's the high quality, and then duplicate that. Change this to LOG2. And then when you like you save these assets as one FBX or whatever, when you import it into Unity, it will auto level of detail these. Um, and then you can adjust. So when it goes from like when you get when the camera gets X amount of meters away from it, it'll move up to the, the higher quality version. So this is one way to optimize poly count based on how close you are to the asset. The catch is the file size is higher because you've got more polygons and stuff. The texture is going to be the same. Um, but yeah, there's that. So I might do that later because you want to clean it up after you've baked the information. So let's do that. That one. Cool. So we have our uh, retopologized <laughs> one of the two um, asset tracing the uh, AI based asset. Um, and once again, I'm not I'm not using it as reference. I'm literally going to use the asset as the end goal. Um, if I had more time, e.g., half a week or whatever I need to. I, or a week or whatever it needs to depending on the asset I would literally make that asset again um, like make the, the squares and do the texturing and make a high polygon version of this and just use that as as reference if that makes sense so I would make one uh, block and then copy it and then make the, the, the doors and all that sort of stuff but two hours is not nearly long enough for a proper uh, asset build so in this session, we're just looking at how to get an AI, an AI asset as is more uh, uh, optimized for use in as uh, in the build-a-thon for one, but also in a space in Mona uh, or a VR game, a standalone VR game, a mobile game, all that sort of stuff. Okay, so summary. We have our low poly asset. We have unwrapped it. We have not given it a material. So let's do that. You yep. Material, let's call it temple. Done. Um, let's go to baking. Yeah. With our material selected, basically here, um, we've got this. We want to add a node uh, to bake into, if that makes sense. So let's go to, what is it, image, texture, put that there. Go new. Uh, I think the limitations for the build are 1024 by 1024, so let's keep it at that. And just go OK. I don't need to connect it, I just needed to have it selected. Um, yeah, let's just do that. So that is now selected. Now. Baking is in, not Eevee, it is in Cycles. So go to the Render Properties, go up to Render Engine, change it to Cycles, change the device to CPU or GPU, depending on what you want to do, and then go Bake down here. And this is where we have all of our options. So, we can bake... Everything, we can bake ambient inclusion, shadow, position, normal, UV, brightness, emission, environment, diffuse, glossy, transmission, you name it. Um, let's do normal, because I think that one always looks cool. So normal is bumping, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we want to turn on selected to active and leave the rest. So let's do this. I think you can use a cage, but I've, and like use that. So basically project that, but I'm, I don't usually do that. I will modify these a little bit. Uh, usually I'll just go point 0.1 to both and then adjust later. Um, now, the selected to active is you select all of the assets. So if you had more than one asset, you would shift select all of the assets. Select all of the high poly assets uh, and then you shift and then select the one you want to bake onto. So the one you want to bake onto is the l last selected object. So we can do that. This should be here. And theories, theories, this will work. <laughs> so I'm just going to press bake. Uh, 
And there we go. So basically, we've got the high polygon information on our normal map. But as you can see, there's some missing pieces of information. And this is uh, probably because of the bake distance, because those deeper holes would be too far back. Um, so uh, I can either add the polygons in there or push this further back. So let's go 5. Not much different. Hmm. Yeah. Diameter in the baking. It, it, it tells based on the normal direction how far to go searching for the high polyester. Yeah, the catch with that though is it seems to be not pushing towards. Ah, uh, could also be too deep because some of these lines are not on the level. So let's optimize that a bit. So some of these might be because it's too far back. Some of these might be too far in. So let's let's play with that a bit. So I'm going to move some of these out to the front. Now that I've roofed mirror. This comes back to the uh, kind of, what would you call it? Get used to <laughs> the fact that you will always be bouncing every step of the way until you have no choice. So a lot of applications are less destructive than they used to be, which is great. Uh, but there are usually, ah, oh, let's do this one. I'm going to push this out a bit, Alt S. Yep, that's good. Uh, and then I'm going to use Shrink Wrap. And if you want to, you can actually do a bit of offset. So I might do that, because that's cool. Perfect. I can only apply in object mode, so that's done. All right, let's try again. That one, that one, that one, fake. What? Why? <laughs> hmm. Why did that do that? Okay, I'm going to try something else here. All transforms. All transforms. Why? What have I done? So usually, that would work. Um, that said, I usually use Substance Painter uh, for my baking, or Marmoset is also good. Um, so rather than troubleshoot why it's doing that, I'm actually going to try... Oh, I'm going to have to install everything. Because I've got my new system. Alright, let's see how long all this takes to install. <laughs> Any cool conversations that we want to talk while I figure this out? Well, 
an ad, uh, but it, it's really complicated because you can wrap your head around it. So if you if you duplicate the low poly asset with the same UV unwrapping, and then you give it a subdivision modifier and make it really high, and then give after the subdivision modifier a shrink wrap modifier, and then apply everything and bake to the high poly model, but it still holds the same shape of the UVs. So you can apply this later to the low poly model. So you actually pay high on high, like that's what you bake. And then you take the, the fake high poly that's been subdivisioned from the low poly, if that makes sense. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like, it sounds like, ah, it sounds like a workaround for something that I could do very easily in Substance Painter. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> yes, yes. That said, it usually works. Like it, it's like this is a bit of a weird situation that I've never really seen before. So apologies to all those watching, um, but this is why we use better tools for the thing we're trying to do. Um, that said, like Substance Painter and Marmosite are like well known as good baking tools. Um, Hmm. I can't get into Steam because I've forgotten my password. <laughs> Dang it! Okay. Pass on that one. Um, I do have. Oh, do I have? Hang on. Have I done baking tutorial in substance? I've done workshops for sure. Maybe not. Uh, one of your twenty tutorials, but it was plain baking, not uh, object baking. Right. Yeah. I think. Okay. I think I'll add that to the tutorial list. Um, so, so on that, while we got everyone here, what asset? Which, which tool do people want to see? baking in because the thing is blender is free um but has its problems um substance is amazing but it is paid um the catch with that one and that's a really interesting one substance painter is an adobe which means you have to go through the subscription model which i hate but substance painter is on steam and uh they usually have steam sales right so one of the best ways to get Substance Painter is on a Steam sale, which is great. So that's one approach. The other approach is Marmoset. How much is that one? Uh, Marmoset's really good uh, as well because it's uh, a really good renderer, if that makes sense. So this one's really good for creating... Um, if you're doing game development and stuff like that, this one's a really good tool for doing renders um to show in art station and whatnot um so a lot of people will use marmoset toolbag um for uh folio creation basically that said over time they've actually started adding a lot more tools so now you can do texturing and baking in marmoset and it's really quite good um so you got some options uh how much is it bye now no! <laughs> Perpetual license. Okay. So they've gone subscription as well. Dang it. Damn you, Adobe. Um, and therefore, you've got the option to go either one. So, yeah, subscription is an interesting one on the grounds that you would have to go for... What's, what's that? 319 divided by $16. 
Let's do the math. Twenty. <laughs> Show off. <laughs> Show off. Did you say? Did you hear me? No. No, no I did. I did. That's what I mean. Show off. Just because you're good at math. Yeah. 20, correct. Walking calculator. So you'd have to go... Um, <laughs> you'd have to go 20 months. So that's two years, basically. Ah, that's a complicated argument. But the thing is, at the end of that two years, you don't own it. But at the end of the two years, you do. But then you'd probably want to upgrade anyway. So, yeah. That's That's not bad. I'll, I'll, I'd take that over Adobe because Adobe's subscription is ridiculous, to be honest. Um, or just a marmoset. Buy a marmoset as a pet. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, do we want to try and figure this out then? I kind of wanted to get a bake in. That's annoying. Um, oh. Well. So, theoretically, that would work. Um, it's just not for this one. Um, if you're doing things like combine, oh. uh, if you're doing things like combine, you do actually have to put lighting in the environment. So I always take the lighting out because I never do lighting in Blender. But that said, it's very easy to do that. So you would get the lighting where you want want to, like with a skybox or um, with your assets in here. So let's get uh, sun, I guess. Doesn't matter where it's placed, and that sort of nicely needs it puts it there let's make it a bit brighter i guess uh 1.5 yeah. two five there we go that looks good um and then when you do combined you can get all of these options sort of in one uh map which makes it look like it has bump and all the rest of it the light won't work as well as it does but it looks like it because the shadows are correct. Um, so once again, as a distant asset, this one diffuse texture would be perfect. But if you get up close to it, um, it wouldn't look as good because you don't have the normal maps, you don't have that bump detail. Um, I think for these sort of things you turn off, oh, I forget which one it is. Well, let's find out. <laughs> okay. Let's try... I'm going to have to try something here because this is not working well. Alt S. Nope. Alt S, scale down. Maybe a bit much. One, do about that. Control A, all transforms. Clean that up again. It usually is, but... Just a habit. Let's try this one. That's looking better. It could also be because I've changed these numbers. I've done this before. I need to look into these a bit more. But I need to look into what is extrusion, what is max ray distance. So let's go 0.5 and 0.1. But this is starting to look a little more like it. Yeah, okay. Break. Okay, I can continue. <laughs> yeah, so that looks what it looks like. So the max ray distance. Uh, tells tells the low poly object based on the normal direction how far to go away from the original mesh in order to calculate the high poly mesh. Which one is that? So it, it, the maximum ray distance is really important because it tells uh, the low poly object to bake how far from the normals of the low poly to the high poly. So if you have uh, uh, the the high poly uh, the low poly if it's larger in in volume than the high poly. Yeah. Then uh, you're gonna have to increase the ray distance to reach out for it. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you will have inverse uh, normals. 
same thing. Um, okay, so maybe the extrusion needs to be smaller. Let's uh, let's just do some experimentation. Let's change the order and see if this breaks everything. Do you know what extrusion does exactly? Oh, I didn't like that one at all. <laughs> Zero point five. Uh, let's go back to normal. Yeah, you got it. Mm. Well, it's reverse. All these colors are reversed. Yeah. So mostly, so it comes to playing down with these ones to make sure. Yeah, that's it. That's what we want. Perfect. Okay. So for this very specific asset, <laughs> <laughs> 0 0.2 and 0 0.5 is perfect. That's what we want. Um, but you also start seeing, like, when, when you start getting the normal, you start seeing some, like, you really start seeing some of the issues that the asset will have, right? So this mess that is this, um, and even that bit. Uh, that said, say, for example, I could take this into Photoshop and clean some of this up, um, like, manually. And that's a really good way to sort of quickly get around things like that. So let's do that. I'll have enough time to look at that. Okay. So we have our normal map, and I like that. So I'm going to go to image, save as. Let's put this into our where are they? tutorials, workshops. This one? Nope. Ah, let's do that. There we go. Um, okay, so let's call that temple zero, no, normal. That's good. Um, let's get, let's get to the fuse. Now I'm going to turn off, I forget which one it is. No, I'm going to turn off direct and indirect and just do color. What I think this does is removes the lighting and just does the, um, the color, hopefully. Yeah. So if, for example, I did direct and indirect, actually, I'm just going to save that so I don't have to do that again. So let's go save as temple diffuse. Cool. So if I put direct and indirect on, uh, and I do bake. I'm thinking, hoping that that will actually bake in some of the the lighting color. Yeah, which it kind of does, um, but I don't really want that, right? So I can do that, but I don't want to. Um, I want that original diffuse. So you have the ability to sort of combine a lot of those these sort of things together. Um, you want to bake, as soon as you find your sweet spot for extrusion and max ray distance, um, they kind of have to be the same. If you edit the, if you edit them between different bakes, then the bake will not line up. So you basically have to keep them the same. I just want to see what this one looks like, and then we'll move on to some other things. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, let's do this. Um, let's open our asset, temple diffuse, lock that into there, and put that. Um, I also want to put a normal map in here, so let's duplicate that one, control D, nope, shift D, normal. Uh, now, with normal, you actually have to put a normal map. So I'm just going to drop off this point and go normal map color there. And then snap that one in there as well. And then it does that for some reason. Uh, but yeah. Interesting. Let's go back to Eevee. So yeah, and then let's get rid of the light. There we go. Now we have a very shiny thing, so let's get the roughness up. 
that's good and metallic down so there we go now that poly count let's get the poly count <laughs> so this poly count is 560 uh, from uh, 9089 so <laughs> uh, that's a fair difference um, let's turn snap off so from a distance eh, apart from the shininess and I'm not sure why that is like roughness is up let's have a look at that is it sheen? Um, how about specular? Seems to be these sort of ones. That said, none of these matter. Well, not, not really, anyway. Um, if you're putting it into uh, Mona, then yeah, but none of this is important because you make the asset in Unity. Um, so. Okay. So you sort of see it. Either way, because because the detail that actually looks kind of better. <laughs> it kind of does. That's nuts. <laughs> and yeah, poly count. <laughs> poly count difference is significant. Now, say for example, we want to do the level of detail thing. So let's do that, and then we'll get that in the in the Unity, for example. So I'm going to go elevate to two, get rid of that one, hide that one, and basically all we're going to do, and do this, um, is basically disappear some of these uh, loops. Um, so those three. Yeah. Uh, let's get rid of these two as well. Sure. So some of it does glitch when you do that. So it depends on the original and how you want to do that sort of thing. Um, and how you set up the original. Uh, so there's that. Ah, uh, because I used the shrink wrap, that did that. So be careful with shrink wrap, I guess. Um, this is better for what we're doing. So you can kind of very easily just get rid of uh, these. And then it doesn't make that much of a difference, if that makes sense. But this, for example, because it has more detail, will start glitching. Um, so there's that. So how can we, maybe those two, see what happens. Yeah. Uh. Now there is a way, I'm pretty sure you could do this. I don't know if this will work though. Huh. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to get a knife and I'm actually going to cut this across. And then see if I can get rid of it that way. Yeah. I'm get, okay, I'm gonna get rid of unselect that one if it lets me. Okay, so it doesn't work as well as I'd like. But I have this idea. Do you really want to get rid of all of those? And then maybe sort of keep these four and 
that might solve that problem. Like so. Yep. Perfect. Uh, I need those because I need that to go down. Let's get rid of these ones, I guess. And once again, because of that door, I'm actually just going to keep the door as is. Cool. Yeah, I mean, once again, from a distance, looks fine. All right. So we have our two assets. Uh, let's grab them both. File, export, FBX. Put this into our book. Selected objects, done. And let's give it a shot in Mona. Um, um, um. Now, where did I put? First, you don't succeed, go to the docks. Hopefully this works. I haven't opened Unity since I installed 2022.3.6 and it still looks like it's being flaky. Maybe? Why? Thanks, Unity. <laughs> right. I'll have to do that all over again. Yeah, doesn't like that one. Okay. <laughs> so I can't show that one either. Grr. Okay. But either way, um, we could, because we've made the asset like, completely, like the normal map and the uh, diffuse map, um, then we could export that as a GLB. Uh, so for the Buildathon um, or minting assets, GLB seems to be the, uh, the NFT standard. Um, but with the Buildathon, you could also submit as a FBX as well. So. Whichever works. So yeah, um, so imagine, if you will, I'll do my little faded thing. Imagine I showed you how that looked in Unity and it was great. Um, <laughs> but I'll have to install Unity and that's always a bit of a hike. Um, but yeah, so the underscore LOD1, LOD2, I think you can have up to four or as many as you want, I think, um, allows you to very quickly create an asset um, at slightly more file size because it has those the the poly counts for each one, right? But if I'm close to it, it can be a high higher polygon, 
asset. Um, but when it's very far away, it can be really small. So if I wanted to, let's try this because that might be fun. Um, let's do level three and get rid of everything. So I'm going to get rid of, no, kind of all of these. And just see how that looks. Uh, because of that door, I'm kind of have to gonna need that. So basically, destroy everything. That's interesting. I'm gonna have to clean that up on the previous versions as well. No idea how this is gonna look. It's gonna be quite amusing. Oh no, I needed that because it's that. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. So this would be like in very, very far distance. But as you can see, it doesn't look that different. <laughs> and the poly count is ridiculously small. I have to leave that because of that glitch, but if I fix that from the original bake, that wouldn't be an issue. Um, I could probably make it look exactly the same as these. Um, and just out of curiosity, that's a 52 polygon asset. Mostly because of that door. Um, so let's have a look at these three assets. So let's go G, let's go over this way. One, two, three. Okay. So if I was really close, I would see all this detail. And then if I get to about maybe here, I would see this detail. And then if I get to about here, I would see this detail. But as you can see, apart from the roof, so I might want to keep that in there, but apart from the ceiling, they're basically the same. Like, you wouldn't even know. Um, so that's what level of detail does, which is super useful for uh, basically any optimization, any game, uh, probably still to this day, apart from maybe Unreal, because they don't care anymore. But uh, every game pretty much will use these sort of tools um, in order to optimize the asset. And in a way, that actually looks better. Because <laughs> it's really clean. I don't mind that at all. <laughs> so maybe I want to... Well, let's do this, because I'm kind of interested in this rail. Um, so say, for example, now that we have our asset, can we add stuff in? Sort of after the texture is done. To get that like little bit more detail in there. Uh, dot on the numpad to Sort of do so. I don't want to. I don't want to do it too close because that's going to stretch. Um, but just a little bit. The thing is also that stretches. So this isn't the best approach to it, to be honest, um, because of the stretching that happens. Uh, that said, you have that sort of detail in there as well. Um, but say, for example, another approach, I guess, would be I could. Uh, Hmm. I haven't thought about this, like basically, basically reverse engineer an asset. Um, basically take this into Photoshop um, or into Substance Painter and paint on it directly. So unwrap it again 
um, and then sort of clean up the texture. So yeah, I think allowing yourself to be creative with how you create your assets allows you to... Mm. One of my favorite things is that the whole idea is you have to learn the rules in order to break them. And this is kind of one of those examples where we have so many different approaches to making an asset that once you know all those uh, uh, approaches to it, so palette texturing, trim sheets, baking, um, reverse engineering from either high poly or low poly, um, all that sort of stuff, then you can start applying those techniques kind of to other techniques um, and really push the asset as far as you can. That's really quite interesting. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to do, <laughs> just quickly, is go to Photoshop and clean up that normal map um, and just show you how I, once again, I personally would do that. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that and we'll wrap it up there. I hate that. Go away. <laughs> um, any questions from the uh, or statements or words of truth or knowledge bites? <laughs> it, it, it's not a question. I just wanted to comment on, on this workshop and you just said it. Yeah, there is no easy way to do a thing. just have to learn all the tool sets and then mixture of it in order to you're always fixing things that's what we do all the time we we learn all the tool sets uh under our hat like they say and you use baking and frame sheets and modeling and modular and and all these stuff are just ways to do things but there's no specific way to do a specific thing that that, that doesn't exist so you just said that i just agreed yeah i think one of, one of my favorite books when i was young was called magician uh, by Raymond E. Feist. Um, I've read it so many times it became memory. Um, like I was I was talking to a friend once. He's like, remember that time we were flying around on the drow? Nope, okay. That's not a real memory. Um, but I really like that idea on the fact that we are always taught in schools, this is how you do it. Um, when the truth is, that is one way to do it. And you can learn from anything um, to take your skill, your art, your craft your knowledge to the next level. Um, and I think it, it, it lends into that sort of stuff where it's just like, there is no magic, there is no true skill. There is all of the skills that you can utilize in ways to get whatever you need done. Um, and I really like that. I think it's quite nice. Precisely. <laughs> this is amazing. You just speak out of my heart. Yeah. So um, my approach to cleaning up RGB, and this is way back when you kind of had to do it, um, a lot of people would consider, and probably do, um, clean up their normal maps on the normal map RGB. The thing that stuck maybe a little bit too hard was, if you start blending these, the colors that start coming up are probably not what might be used. So it's not as clean as it could be. Um, so I could just uh, not erase. Um, where's, where's Blur? Burn, sponge, nope. Smudge, that's the one. So say for example doing this, the, it gets a little muddy, if that makes sense. But if I go to red, and the catch is I don't know. There we go. So I can uh, pick, color pick, uh, elements of this asset to sort of clean this up like manually, if that makes sense. Now, if I understood normal maps even better, um, I could probably like start doing some really cool stuff with this. Um, and I'm sure there are 100% people who do that. Um, the other one I think is uh, stamping. Yeah. Stamping also works. So you've got that sort of thing. Um, it's just kind of messed that. Um, and then when you go to green, it'll all be messed up again. So you have to do sort of the approach there. Um, but this is a really good way to create the equivalent of uh, basically um, real clean normal maps where you have basically full control 
over what the result's going to be. Um, so I find this pretty good. Um, but yeah, if I understood normal maps, I could like 100% make this exactly how I want to make it, uh, if that makes sense. So that's an for, interesting... For those of you who doesn't know uh, the magic is doing, uh, you, you just click Alt in order to stamp it where you would like yes. to stamp from. And then, yeah. I need to, I actually made a, a, what do you call it, a hockey tool. Um, I should use it. Uh, last time I tried it, it didn't work because, yeah, but I should use that. Um, one approach, and this is a long time ago when you really needed to optimize uh, normal maps. Um, the company I was working for got rid of blue. Um, and they, I think they put the metallic in this one. Um, so basically the shader that they used, used the red and green of the normal map as a normal map and blue they just made flat uh, they didn't count and made it into a normal like just white um and the result was quite interesting actually so so he, this is the example right if you if you look at that um yeah so you have this end result and that would look a lot better than what it would have um had we not done this uh, let's just do a little bit more. And I'll leave that. Let's make that that one. Yeah. So as you can see, it, it starts getting a, a, a lot neater. Um, uh, what would you call it? Things. <laughs> Things like this with really sharp edges, that's usually a bit of a glitch. Um, so you could clean up or soften that if you wanted to. Um, over here, this is a nightmare. Um, so you, you'd probably clean that up, like, a lot. Um, to be honest, the, the, this was one of those weird where bits on the original AI asset that had, like, basically a mash of polygons. Um, so the other approach is fix the original asset, and that would be better. Um, so go into ZBrush or even Blender and sculpt it out. Um, and sort of clean that up. The problem with that is you'd probably mix up the um, the texture that comes with it a bit. So yeah, balancing between uh, self texturing and retexturing and uh, cleaning up at any stage um, is a whole part of the process. So let's save that out. Um, it is frustrating that Blender doesn't auto-update. So as you can see here, it's still it's still messy. So I'll have to go open, go normal, and then that's clean. Uh, so that's that. Now, we might not see the results there. Um, that one. Let's see if we can figure out. Let's go that one. There. Okay, cool. Right. So that's a bit cleaner. So yeah. I have so a question. Sure. I have a question about unwrapping. And is it true that we we could have t you could have taken the four sides and overlapped them? Yes. Well, and then a ball. Ish. <laughs> go ahead. In this one. Um. But yes, that is a very common optimization approach to being able to say, if you had four sides, um, in this experience, um, I would... Hmm, how would I do it? Yeah, I, I would make one side, bake that, and then just copy that around, um, if that makes sense. But yes, the, the catch with that is, and this is the way around it, so say for example, you have all your assets and you want to bake it. Um, what I would do is grab this and then grab all of the uh, assets that you're not going to bake that information, if it's still there, and then move it off. Um, so I could go G1, right? 
So these uh, polygons would bake and these polygons would not. So depending on what you're doing there, you can move things out if you want to. The But my approach for that would be, in this case, I would make one wall and the, the top, um, bake that information and then copy that wall around and try and match it up. And then the catch with that though is you'd have to like, how this edge, like this seam, might not look great because of the that loop, if that makes sense. But that would allow you to make this, like say one edge, like four times bigger, um, because you're you're using the same polygon. Um, so when it comes to baking and mirroring there are some really interesting approaches to optimize an asset to look like it's like the seam in the middle. So say for example, what would I do? Let's, let's see if I can make a quick example to show you. So let's just hide those. So say for example, I make uh, a sphere is a good example of, of this actually. So let's do that. So say for example, I needed to, I wanted to mirror a VRM. Uh, so I could double the texture on, on the whole asset, if that makes sense. So you would think to just uh, delete one side and uh, bake that information onto the low polygon and then mirror it. The problem with that is this seam will very clearly look like a seam and basically look terrible because you're baking this normal uh, at an angle and this normal on the other side will be slightly different so it doesn't work. Um, one approach that I will quickly go over and I forget if this is exactly how to do it um, Moody might be able to step in with some of this but I will extrude this uh, that one, that one, that one, there. So I will extrude this. So you've got this normal. I would uh, make the UV, like I would apply the UV to this. So it looks like this blends over, right? And the normals of this seam will be correct. Because when you flip it, the, the thing works out, if that makes sense. Now... The catch is, it's been a long time since I've done this, I don't know if the mirror can be flat like this, which is very quick, or I have to basically flip the whole character, if that makes sense. Uh, so let me do something. Let's do a mirror on the y-axis. Apply that. Um, and then I'm going to get rid of these ones, if that makes sense. So I forget if you can do it straight, or it has to be, like, the same. So hopefully that helps. Um, so let's get rid of them. And probably them. Right? So that way, this seam will be accurate to the flip. Um... And then you can continue on your way, basically. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, You've no definitely worries. gone to places on this that I have never gone before. I really appreciate what you're doing here. Yeah, happy to happy to happy to educate. Uh, once again, all the things that I figured out the hard way because. Back when I was learning, we didn't have YouTube. <laughs> so I was like, all right. Um, so yeah, so if if you're doing that, and I highly recommend it for VRMs because you want the highest quality with the lowest resources, right? And textures are the biggest resource. So yeah, uh, overlapping UVs is a great way to do it. But because of normal maps specifically, diffuse, it's not as bad, but with normal maps, um, it does get a little tricky with seams um, for that. So if you do that, give that a shot um, and see if you can get a sort of a better uh, solution 
to the mirrored seam. The other approach is make sure that your seams are just not seen or where they should be, right? So say for example, you might have an asymmetric torso, um, so a sash over the top or a belt or something like that, but the arms are exactly the same. Um, so you would flip, uh, you would overlap the arm UVs um, and the leg UVs, but have the torso head um, and stuff not be uh, overlapped. So you have that choice of what is asymmetrical, what is symmetrical, um, and anything that is symmetrical, you can overlap. Um, but once again, the seam has to be an exact copy to the other side. So if, say for example, the shoulder seam to the arm is a little bit different because of the asymmetricity of the torso, then that might be a little bit tricky. That said, because the shoulder joint, like usually depending on the clothes, depending on the design, has a seam, um, if it looks like a seam, it, it's correct. <laughs> You've done it right. Um, so there's all different approaches to how do I design the character? And this is from the start. So I'm going to design the character with the limitations of the thing that I want to make the character better, if that makes sense. And I think that's one of the things like, coming from game development um, is any any generalist, so someone who does everything, will not be great at anything. And some things will be worse than others. But you can actually design an experience or an asset or a creation to your disadvantage, not away from your disadvantage. So especially now when you get meme games and stuff, so say you're a great programmer, but you're terrible at art. Actually make the game focused around bad art. <laughs> um, and do amazing game mechanics, right? So uh, what was it? N++? Like that platformer? It was basically a stick figure. And a great game. Like it's one of the classics because it did platforming perfect. Um, the graphics weren't good, but they didn't need to be. Um, and it did really well. Um, whereas sometimes you'll get a lot of people moving away from what you're bad at because like you're bad at it. Right. So I think there is a, a balance to like designing your experience, your asset, your character to your strengths and weaknesses, and that will make your character asset or experience significantly better. So uh, another bit of world's word of wisdom that I've got in regards to my state. Um, but yeah, that's because I've done everything by myself and I just refuse to sort of like work with anyone because I want to do everything myself because I want to learn everything myself. So, <laughs> Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's one thing. But say for example, a, a, a really clear way around the shoulder thing. So if you were going to design something and you wanted to overlap the arms but not the torso, then you would get something like shoulder plates, right? So shoulder armor that like sort of is very hard to see the seam between um, the arm and the plates. And then that's easy. Like that's that's an easy workaround. But say, for example, if you're doing a, a race car driver, because you don't really see any hard edges on that asset, you would have to be a little bit more uh, careful with how you create the seam around the shoulders. Uh, depending on if you were making an asymmetric torso, which you probably would, because the um, ah, it depends on the design. So uh, that's the that's the way around that. Um, apologies for not being able to clear clarify if you had to shape it like exact mirror or extension. Um, I haven't done that for a while, uh, but yes, one of those two will work. Um, and then once you've baked it, you would actually get rid of the polygons, if that makes sense. Um, and then mirror it, um, because then the, yeah, yeah, so that's the, the other step for that, is once you've baked it with the, let's say, the extension, um, you have that normal map correct, you could, if you wanted to, maybe clean up the texture so it gets rid of those extra polygons, if you wanted that space as well, um, and then delete them, and then mirror it, and then the, the, the UV, the, the normal map information should transfer pretty, pretty well to be honest. So, 
that's that's the workaround there. Um, but yeah, excellent question on the grounds that overlapping is a great way to save or optimize spaces. So the choice there though, and that's another one of the big choices, do I reduce the texture and keep the same size um, or do I double the size and make the quality better? Um, that is up to you. <laughs> But yeah, once again, it comes down to what is the platform? Where is it going to end up? Is it going to end up in a mobile game? Is it going to open on a standalone VR? I basically see those two as the same thing. Uh, mobiles are not as strong um, as VR standalone, but standalone VR standalone has to render at basically 90 frames a second to be comfortable. Um, 80 if you're pushing it. Um, so you have to push more information with a pretty low-end device but then you have desktop um and that's like do whatever you want <laughs> so yeah all right that's nearly two hours fantastic happy with that um so hopefully everyone learned something uh appreciate you all jumping in appreciate the claps <laughs> um <laughs> And yeah, we'll okay. wrap it up there. Any other questions before wrapping it up? See you later. All right. Cheers. Uh, good luck with your assets, Jay. Hopefully, uh, come uh, once again, if you have any questions, just jump in and support or uh, build a chat. Um, happy to answer whenever I'm about, which is a fair bit. Um, yeah, I, I love I love getting people where they need to. So if there's anything I can help with, just uh, hit us up and we'll all say what we can. Thank you very much. I'm, I really appreciate what you did. You showed me a lot of things that I hadn't seen yet and uh, inspired me to go go farther. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, I look forward to seeing the result. Make sure you post uh, in the Discord so we can see. Can you guys hear me? You bet. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, are we allowed to use AI created as... You're breaking up a bit, but I did hear... Are we allowed to use AI? I'm assuming for the build-a-thon. Um, feel free to use the chat. Oh, I missed the chat. Oh, there we go. Sci-fi, gotcha. Okay. That was the question. Yeah, cool. Um, yes, for the build-a-thon, uh, you are allowed to use AI, but one, you have to... I think there is a, um, uh, a parameter property uh, in the submission that asks, did you use AI? Um, and then you have to clarify what you used it for. Um, so you can, and I think there's a, there's a whole category using stability AI. Um, now I've looked into that and it's basically recommends like 24 gigs of VRAM, which I don't have on my 4070 Ti. So I don't, I don't know what graphics card has 24 gig RAM. Um, but yes, uh, you can do it. Uh, you can uh, use it. You have to give reference to it. Um, and my approach to it, a lot of this, I think, is AI is fine as long as you're still creating. So I've I've seen some things where it's just like some people will say they'll they'll type five words, it'll come up with a uh, a three D asset, and then they'll say, "Hey, I'm an AI artist." Um, I can say that that's not gonna win any competitions. <laughs> uh, that said, I've seen things where you'll have people take assets that they've made through AI, be it Mid Journey, Stability. Uh, Luma, you name it, um, and then taking that a lot further. So in my mind, across the board with AI is like taking those assets to create bigger and better and more amazing things. So say, for example, if you do AI, use it for reference, make the asset uh, better, faster, quicker. Um, that's great. Um, optimizing, that's definitely a, an art form. So if you do a really optimized asset for 3D AI art, that's cool. Um, stuff like that. So the answer is yes, you have to give reference, uh, but I don't know, kind of bring something to the table. <laughs> um, but the thing is also on, on the flip side of that, you, you have to, because if you just submit AI art with that doesn't have any optimization, then it's, it's not a good WebGL asset at all. Um, so there is a craft 100% to optimization. So it could just be that. Um, what was the other thread that was gonna pull on that one? 
I forget. It's gone. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, it's 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 an interesting space. Uh, I'm not against it. It's just the culture that's coming with it, um, and there's the, like government and company level, not not the the practical side of it. Um, so as an artist, it's going to be hard for a lot of us, I think, to navigate moving forward. Um, especially because once again, AI in its current state is the worst it's ever going to be. Um, and it's getting good real quick. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Um, that said, it's cool. Science is going to be amazing. Um, like the stuff they've already done with it. And the fact, yeah, as you said, if, if they're using chat GPT-5 to come up with Sora, I could just imagine what you can do with science. Like, will we get time travel? Will we get jump drives? Like, I, I hope so. Because that'd be cool. <laughs> Sorry, bit, bit of a tangent there. But yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> with reference. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Have a wonderful day. No worries. You too. <clears throat> Have a Good great later. day all. All right. See you. Great, great, great day, everybody. Thank you very much. Aloha. <laughs>